A while back, you remember the demonstration in Dallas, that great big demonstration, 50 people for the KKK? Well, that was pretty well publicized in the mass media, or in Dallas, a little bit down here. But the much larger anti-KKK demonstration of at least 2,000 people was hardly noticed in the conventional media, generally not mentioned at all. Well, we're going to reverse that equation tonight and show what really happened down there in Dallas on Alternative Views News Magazine. going to have some clippings, some videotapes of the rallies against the Ku Klux Klan by different blacks and progressives in Dallas. We'll also have some clips that Frank has assembled about the Ku Klux Klan and some of the right-wing publications that are promoting racism today. Well, let's have some news. As usual, we start out with oil. Al, you've got some oil news, do you not? Well, um, what we have here, Frank, is some of the underdeveloped countries in the world developing their heavy, ar heavy uh, tar oil fields. Uh, we had an announcement in the Austin Statesman, not in the Wall Street Journal, uh, uh, November 28th, that Venezuela, uh, the state petroleum company, plans to develop its uh, Orinoco heavy tar fields. I believe you did have a story about that on Alternative Views some time ago. That's right. That's November 5th in the Spotlight newspaper. Right. The establishment folks are just now picking it up, huh? The, the significance of it is that Venezuela claims that they can develop this oil for between 5 to $13 a barrel. The U.S. Department of Energy says that if Venezuela, which is one of the developing nations, gets an economical and profitable program going, it could lead to exploration of deposits in this country. And by my estimates, in, in Canada alone, there's something like two trillion barrels of heavy, heavy um, tar or tar oil um, in Canada. Uh, the amount in the United States, I really don't know, but I know that in Idaho alone, they have about 30 billion barrels potential of this stuff. How much do they say there? That uh, Venezuela has a potential of 500 billion barrels, and okay. I know there's some differences in opinion there. Right. In the Liberty Lobby story, they said it was one to two trillion barrels. Another story from one of the developing nations, Frank, is that it is uh, Brazil led by its German scientists, I assume some of them, of course, refugees from World War II. Uh, <laughs> Can't you call them Nazis? Let's go ahead and call them Nazis. <laughs> are running diesel engines on oil from soybeans, peanuts, castor seeds, sunflowers, and in the future they plan to grow force of energy. Uh, they have at least 400 species of native trees that produce hydrocarbons directly from the sun's energy. One, of them, one example is the Copacabaya tree. Uh, which produces up to 26 gallons a year of an oil with a chemical composition that is very close to diesel. Uh, the Brazilians claim it's a perfect substitute in diesel engines. They can run this oil from this tree directly in the engine without any modifications at all. Performance is exactly the same. Brazil has also been running um, cars on a mixture of 20% alcohol and 80% gasoline. And by 1980, which will be next year, they plan to produce a quarter of their automobile production running on, on straight, pure alcohol. It's kind of a paradox. We have, again, one of the lower-ranked developing nations developing alternative uh, synthetic fuels, Frank. And coming right from trees. Coming from trees. I think we, we reported on alternative views some time ago that there's a award-winning physicist at the University of California, Berkeley, who, um, who, who's worked in, the, um, in cactus plants suggest that in the United States and the Sonora Desert alone, there are enough, you could actually farm cactus there to make the uh, country energy self-sufficient. And the cactus plant produces pure hydrocarbons, uh, sort of a uh, oozy, milky white fluid that comes directly from the plant without any conversion process. I've heard of the word decompression as applied to people. Normally you think it's uh, somebody in the water, right, who uh, is down too deep and they have to put them in a decompression tank. Maybe that is the best uh, analogy or description for what's going on for the people who were released 
uh, hostages who were released by Khomeini. And then they gave a news conference, and they were making statements favorable to the Iranians, favorable to the Iranian Revolution. Uh, they were hurriedly uh, taken to a military base in West Germany, and the State Department said they were taken there for decompression, which means, I guess, that they wanted to get them to cease their pro-Iranian anti-war statements. Carter also made a speech that they were brainwashed. This came one day in the media, but then it uh, quickly uh, disappeared, <laughs> as if anyone that was against the Shah uh, had, had their brains washed. There was also, you remember, these wild rumors that they were going to, that some Iranians were going to kidnap uh, the governor of Minnesota. Oh, right. that was played, you know, up in the news. Well, it was later determined to be absolutely false and bogus, but that fact was not placed on the news. Uh, in fact, speaking of the news, uh, the ratings for news has gone up 14 percent as the Iranian crisis continues. More people than ever before in history are watching uh, the evening uh, news. This shows that people are interested in uh, international affairs and are interested in watching uh, television news and getting information about international uh, political uh, events. It's curious that uh, Iran, in fact, has totally dominated the uh, news. There's been 30 minutes often of nothing but Iranian uh, news at night. So it's curious that previously international news was reduced to almost nothing and Americans hardly knew anything about Iran. And now that we have this great drama going on, it has uh, taken over the news. Speaking of prisoners of sorts, we'll have a change of venue here. The IRS has just found out that prisoners, U.S. prisoners, are in the United States, have been making up fake W-2 forms, sending them into the IRS and getting refunds. So I'm not suggesting anybody do that, but I'm saying that uh, uh, the prisoners who, well, they make about $5 a month at the most, they're just supplementing their income with a little moonlighting. What do you have? Speaking of income, what do you Speaking of some? income, right. This is um, from a newsletter from Congressman Marvin Lee, whose district is the 11th Congressional District. And, of course, his, his, his big beef here is that poor people are, are, are getting all the money and the rich people are getting none. Uh, <laughs> we'll overlook his rabidness for the time being. But he has some interesting figures on what has been happening to federal income. As, as most of you who watch this program know, it's one of my pet peeves that I keep people attuned to how much you are not making and how much less that you're making because of inflation. Speaking of inflation, you know, Frank, one of my, my favorite reports is the Charmin report, Charmin toilet paper. Yeah. And I noticed it in the Austin Statesman, the local newspaper here in town, they actually did the Charmin test here about a week or so ago, and they, they found out much to their dismay that the new fluffier Charmin contains 400 sheets, where the old Charmin contained 500 sheets, so you're actually getting less wipe uh, per buck. <laughs> Uh, but from 1972 to 1979, medium family income climbed from $11,152 to $18,467, and so most of us are fairly happy because of that. Uh, but in that same period of time, federal income taxes increased 82%, while Social Security taxes increased 142%. So uh, in, in real terms, with uh, inflation accounted for, your actual purchasing power in that period of time has dropped something like $700. Now, of course, that does not include the bite in, in state and local taxes, such as gasoline taxes, alcohol taxes, and property taxes. To put it more succinctly, in 1969, the median family of four income was $9,277 before taxes. After taxes, it was $7,947. And ten years later, in 1979, the median family of four income is $18,467. After taxes, $15,546. But if you compare after-tax income of 1969 with after-tax income adjusted for inflation of 1979, we've actually lost. Uh, in 1969, after-tax income was $7,947. The <clears throat> after-tax adjusted for inflation income of 1979, 10 years later, is $7,800. You've lost $147 in purchasing power in 10 years. And again, this does not include state and local taxes, which by my estimates have increased on a nationwide average of somewhere between 25 to 30 percent in, in, in just the 72, 79 period. It's also probably not adjusted for the <clears throat> devaluation of the dollar compared to other uh, 
currencies abroad, which also cut into our purchasing power. Well, the devaluation of dollar is, is figured out in terms of inflation, because, of course, the devaluation of dollar pushes up the price of imported goods, which, you know, make up such a large portion of our consumer goods now anyway. This is a conscious effort, which has been on the minds of business and the power structure for years. Remember that, uh, oh, almost a year ago, we read the article from the famous edition of Business Week, what was 1975, I think, where it said that right. Americans are going to have to get used to having a lowered standard of living. We the also new mentioned era of scarcity. Right. The book Ethics and Profits, which was um, about, and the, the, the quotes of businessmen saying that we're going to have to bite the bullet. And just recently, Paul Volcker, who's the head of the Federal Reserve banking system told the Congressional Committee the standard of living of the average American has to decline. Well, actually, it has declined, as we all know. Instead of the top standard of living in the world, I think we're down to about 12th or 14th. We're even below Canada and Japan now. The, all this is dawning on the American people that the prosperity in the 50s and 60s was really gone, and it was almost an illusion, really. Uh, Mother Jones says that prosperity was never the creation of business acumen, that it was a consequence of women flooding the market at low wages, so there would be two incomes in the family, pension funds pumping hundreds of billions of dollars into investments because there was no place else to put those savings, and the vast overseas markets filled with cheap labor and the booming demand. But that is gone now, and most people, well, I don't know. I haven't seen any polls to know whether people realize that the time is gone and we're back and we're going to all be biting the bullet, even the upper middle class who won't be able to travel abroad all the time and have all the nice goodies that they are uh, uh, used to having. And as Mother Jones says, we've all ended up locked in as a serf who was sold with the land. Well, Frank, in terms of biting the bullet, I think it's safe to say anybody making below $50,000 will be biting the bullet. This country is run by people who make over $50,000, and, and for those of you who have forgotten, we're talking about 205,000 individuals in this country who make more than $50,000 a year, yet they own about 30% about, about, uh, of all real wealth in the United States. They own over 50% of the common stock and close to 90% of all, all government bonds. And these are the people whose standards of living haven't been affected by this. But anybody below that, of course, has. Here in Austin, people below, making less than uh, about thirty or forty thousand dollars a year can't even afford to buy a house anymore. In addition to all this, their representatives in Congress, who are paid for by the corporations, are still at work. For instance, uh, the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee introduced uh, a bill that would change depreciation uh, rules for industry on property and equipment which would in effect cut corporate taxes by $35 billion. And he also introduced another bill that would cut uh, federal corporate and personal income taxes and Social Security by $135, $130 billion and replace them with a value-added tax, which means that they would produce a 10% tax in practically everything consumers buy at the federal level, which is passed on every time that the goods change hands. Yeah, that would be real bonanza in the oil industry, wouldn't it? Oh, wow. <laughs> so this would reduce business taxes by at least $54 billion in addition to that. This so is what's so depressing about the 1980 election that's coming up on us. Every single one of the candidates is coming out for lowering corporate taxes and giving more breaks to business, including Teddy Kennedy, as we uh, discussed a couple of weeks ago. So no one has really addressed the issue of the concentration of wealth and power in America in any way to redistribute this and to help the common uh, people in this era of increased uh, scarcity and depression. So it doesn't look like we have any political solutions that are being offered by the uh, system that are on the uh, horizon. Instead, we have the KKK. The KKK and, well, hey, let's talk about, you know, we had that tremendous documentary, Blacks Britannica, here on Alternative Views uh, a few weeks ago. Right. A couple weeks ago, we played the first time on television the uncensored version of Blacks Britannica. Well, Jump Cut, a radical film journal yesterday, just sent me a copy that had the two lead articles on Blacks Britannica that told what was left out and why it was uh, censored. It was shown in a truncated version by PBS. And according to David Kopf, the, the head of the uh, station in Boston that had requisitioned it, 
said that he had to cut certain parts of it out because of the, um, the domination of the film by a small group of people who shared the same ideology. Cope asked, what ideology is that? And they, the station manager answered, it's clear from the moment that the word Marx and Engels is, are mentioned what the ideology is. So the very fact that a few of the blacks uh, interviewed about the situation of racism in Britain mentioned the words Marx and Engels was too much for PBS. You couldn't even mention these taboo words. So those uh, selections were cut out. They also cut out images of police in uh, Britain shooting at a uh, black uh, target that was uh, too inflammatory that cops would actually want to take target practice at blacks. And they also rearranged uh, the order of uh, some of the sequences so it would look like that the black violence had uh, caused police uh, repression and brutality rather than conditions of uh, life, the poverty, the police uh, harassment and brutality had evoked a violent response on the part of the blacks. So this is a model of censorship. This is PBS in action, taking out all the radical elements of this documentary and sort of sanitizing it to fit uh, their ideology. Well, I received from Mike Jankowski, a former UT librarian uh, and now information finder, sent me a copy of a publication, uh, uh, a British publication, in which he sh showed that they wouldn't even show it in England. Right. And not only that, but uh, WGBH, the PBS affiliate in Boston that was responsible for all of the uh, censorship and for the production of it, or at least licensing the production of it, they have even, uh, they're trying to stamp out the original version. They're, they're trying to keep the producer from uh, showing it anywhere, not only in the United States, but in the world. Right. They're showing it at film festivals. They want them to keep them from showing that. They claim that they uh, own it and that uh, he, the filmmaker can't uh, show it. In fact, a conservative MP, a member of parliament in uh, Britain, complained to the American ambassador that Blacks Britannica was too uh, dangerous and asked him to try to prevent its uh, showing in the United States. So you have uh, com possible complicity of government, both in Britain and America, in censoring this show. And yet time, I think it was uh, New York Times, wrote an editorial which was favorable to Blacks Britannica. John O'Connor, who is a liberal yeah. TV critic yeah. in his column, it wasn't the newspaper per se. Well, it's time for the quote for the day. And we were talking about the KKK. Here's uh, one of the local newspapers. Talks about the police chief of Stanley, North Carolina. He said, we had no unpleasant experiences with the Klan and its members. Generally speaking, people in our community don't regard the Klan as a violent organization. Well, as most of you might be aware of, we do have a few racial problems here in the United States. Matter of fact, the Klan, the Triple K, seems to be making quite a comeback. Uh, you see it in the television, you see in many of the newspapers. A lot of the things never make television that you read about in some of the alternative press. For instance, uh, was there anything about this on TV, talking about more than 600 people protested the Tidewater visit or in the Norfolk area of Ku Klux Klan Imperial Wizard Bill Wilkinson on October, in early October. He'd been boasting about his recruiting success there in the Navy in and around Norfolk, but only about 50 uh, diehard Triple Kers were there. But this is something that was happening all the time. Another story talks about this one in the Guardian magazine a newspaper, talks about two foremen at Ford plant in Durban coming to work wearing a little hat with KKK across it and the workers protested, stopped the assembly line, and eventually got those two foremen fired, or at least transferred. We've been reading about the uh, Ku Klux Klan making advances in the military and creating a lot of problems aboard ship. They're even going into schools, high schools even, distributing literature and recruiting there. In the prisons, they're quite active. And there was another story in, uh, in the militant ma uh, newspaper indicating that they were even har harassing Vietnamese down south. Well, the FBI estimates that there are no more than 8,000 Klan members nationwide. However, 
a, a head of one of the, there are about four different distinct um, old fragmentations, if you might want to call it, of the KKK, uh, one of which uh, the Knights of the Triple K uh, received 11,000 votes for a state senator, uh, state senate race in Louisiana last year. Another is called Invisible Empire, run by Bill Wilkerson. We mentioned him a while ago. But during the 1920s, the Klan could claim three to five million members, or 25 to 30 percent of the entire Protestant population in the country at the time. But then in the early 60s, it had really dropped down to where it was just a very fragmented uh, remnant of its former self. But the Klan of the 20s was the largest mass political organization in the history of the United States, with the exception of the Democratic and Republican parties, of course. But it represented a vast network of, or of organizations with enough political clout to elect a senator, several members of Congress even. And although the Klan was strong in many southern states, it also had a great deal of uh, of mass following in other, or in other states uh, outside the South, Pennsylvania, Indiana, Oregon. And far from just being anti-black, the Klan had a broad right-wing program all across the board, including uh, a bent toward fundamentalist religion, anti-capitalism, moralism, and very much against labor and the labor movement. Well, after a brief uh, post-war boom, in 1919, this was when the agricultural depression hit the United States, and a lot of the conditions which led to the boom of the KKK then, after World War I, are in evidence today. Rising unemployment, people coming in from other countries to compete for jobs in the United States, the way they are now coming in illegally from uh, Mexico. And so the Klan seized upon and exploited the fears of the population and catapulted itself into political power. And it looks like it's coming back and do that today. Up in Dallas, remember, just uh, a few days back, there was a Klan rally followed by an anti-Klan demonstration of considerably greater magnitude. We thought you might like to take a look at just what uh, the Klan has to say itself, or at least one of the segments of it, they put out a newspaper called the Thunderbolt. The Thunderbolt, <laughs> well, you know, they just say, read it, and you'll see what it's like. We have some, uh, a little bit of headlines and all from the Thunderbolt, and you can see what they have in mind. Racism, of course, is right up at the top. Mainly uh, anti-black, also against any type of races, uh, races of other, other, other colors, other uh, origins, browns, black, and particularly against any type of immigration of these people into the United States. Another foundation of the Thunderbolt and the KKK in general is anti-Semitism. They're just livid when they see any person who is in the government who is Jewish and they can contribute a lot of our problems to the Jews. As a matter of fact, one of the triumphant headlines in which they finally came out with after apparently years of research was that we knew it all along, we suspected it all along, but now we can prove it. Rockefellers are Jews. They believe that in uh, Mexico also. And uh, I was down there and they were telling me that the Rockefellers and Muhammad Ali were Jewish. <laughs> and I asked them about Muhammad Ali, and they said, well, his last name, Ali. And uh, I pointed out that not all bankers were uh, Jewish, and uh, certainly very few blacks were. And in fact, Muhammad Ali was a Muslim. So, Ali, how do they come up with a Jewish name? Well, anti-Semitism <laughs> and racism is not based on rationality. Yeah. Well, you would think that they also had a, a big thing about anti-communism and red baiting, but I guess that isn't quite as in fashion as it was back in the, well, the 50s because, but they still, in one issue, we found that they did have this business of Hollywood being red infiltrated. Just well, like even it. recently, uh, there was those people that were attacked and killed by the Klan in uh, North Carolina claimed to be communists, so that there was definite anti-communism in that. 
But the Klansmen are not just laughable fools. They maim and they murder. The Thunderbolt encourages this hostility against other races, particularly blacks, as is shown in this comic strip, where a poor white man sees a black man and white woman coming out of a disco and decides to take violent action against them, saying that he won't sleep tonight if he doesn't. He wants to prevent racial mixing. So he does indeed take direct action, beating up the black man and saying that he's going to get the woman after he finishes off the black man. Calling her a gray dog. Then he returns to his home or room, which is a rundown place, indicating that it may not have furthered the revolution, but it satisfied the soul. John Duncan is head of the Texas Civil Liberties Union. You and your fellow civil libertarians around the country and the ACLU must be very concerned about the activities of the Ku Klux Klan. Well, we're afraid we might be asked to represent them. <laughs> We're first of all, and this presents some problems within the liberal community, a free speech organization, a defender of the First Amendment. We have represented the right of the Ku Klux Klan in the past to assemble, to speak, and we do that for any group, regardless of their political affili affiliation. We would be quite concerned uh, if the Klan were running a police department and the policies of a police department were in effect Klan policies because at that point you move from speech to action and there you've got the potential for a uh, violation of civil rights. A lot of people I know are very critical of this position, are they not? Particularly when it seems so easy and it happens frequently when the Klan is exercising their First Amendment rights of assembly and free speech to uh, either whip out the sticks and start clubbing people or whip out the rifles and start shooting people. Well, we've got laws to deal for, with that type of activity and we certainly have not opposed prosecuting anyone for violating another person's civil rights. What we're, all we have done in the past and what we will continue to do in the future is say that as long as you're dealing with ideas and assembly, speech, and things of that variety, we will defend the right to, as guaranteed in the First Amendment, peaceably assemble and to speak. Mm -hmm. What about the Klan and what they're doing now? Does this seem to be different from historically what they've been up to, or is it just kind of a resurrection of the same old thing? Well, uh, I don't think there's anything new from what we saw in the 1920s and the emergence of the Klan at that time um, as a political force in some areas. It is of some concern what is going on down there at Sea Drift at the moment. Um, Which is what? Um, that is the case of the Vietnamese immigrants who were harassed, they were not accepted by the community, they were threatened, they had their civil rights violated, and finally in a confrontation between some of the domestics in uh, Seabrook and the Vietnamese. A U.S. citizen or, uh, or a native there was killed. A jury over in Seguin found just uh, that uh, it was self-defense. What has happened now is the Klan has gone in there and is trying to stir up anti-Vietnamese sentiment, uh, raising cane over a piece of evidence that was suppressed by a court in Seguin and by the judge there attempting to obtain that evidence and in effect cast some doubt as to whether or not uh, a murder occurred or whether or not it was um, self-defense. This is somewhat parallel then to an article I read about uh, the Klan also taking on the Vietnamese in Alabama. It looks like they're spreading out. It's not just the blacks mm. and the Catholics and the Jews and the communists. It's also it's, the aliens. Uh, anybody, right? Uh, they've been active along the Texas border, at least in terms of leafleting. Also along the California border in terms of anti-Hispanic uh, uh, propaganda. What about the problem of the KKK and the police? You read in a lot of articles and hear people talk about the affinity, close affinity, which the Klan has with the police. And some people say, 
and apparently it's been documented in uh, some places that uh, a lot of members of police departments around the country are actually Klan members. So it's not too surprising that the police frequently treat the Klan either with very velvet gloves or uh, don't molest them at all. You hear uh, stories to that effect. Uh, I will say again, we've done something that's not real popular within the liberal community, and that is taking the position that a person should not be dismissed from a police department solely because of membership in the Klan. That if, if you show that they are act using their position as a police person to advance the causes of the Klan, at that point you have grounds for dismissal. But uh, mere membership in the Klan is no different from mere membership in the Communist Party or any other group. and. We have, uh, from left to right, taken the position that people should not be discriminated against on the basis of mere political affiliation or political belief. What happens in, the, in a case like, like in Greensboro, North Carolina, where five people were killed by the Klan, in which it came out that the police actually notified the Klan of the activities, or a member of the Klan, of the itinerary of the marchers and also they stayed a healthy distance about two blocks away from the demonstration kept it under observation but did nothing to although they realized that the clan people were coming into town they did nothing to monitor their activities or to prevent their shooting yeah. uh, this is certainly a danger when there is a close relationship or membership of the clan and the police is or not uh, danger and uh, if all of that is accurate it would fall within the conspiracy to violate civil rights statute a federal statute that for which the police officer could be prosecuted just as those who committed the murders could be prosecuted mm -hmm. what is the situation with the Klan now why is it spreading so rapidly over the United States and why is it so active at the present time and who are they against what is this Klan phenomenon like at the present time? Where is it going? Well, we have four people with us now who will discuss this. Four intrepid souls who were up in Dallas in that uh, November 3rd demonstration, an anti-demonstration by the uh, KKK up there. Adela Mancias, Belma Roberts, Casey Real, and our own Deborah Hill from ACTV. Deborah also lived in England for six years, and so she knows what the Klan's counterparts are like over there in England. Well, tell me first, what was it like in Dallas? The media only covered it very superficially. What was the feeling like up there? When I got there, I saw only a small group of uh, Klan's persons uh, dressed in white with a traditional robe, and they were outlined by um, uh, Klan's people in uh, mock military uniforms outskirting them and there were only about 50 altogether and I followed them through the streets of Dallas and around this 50 group of Klan's people there came hordes of anti-Klan uh, people expressing anti-Klan demonstrations so I think that there were at least 2,000 people who were marching around the Klan expressing anti-Klan sentiments and there was another 2,000 people waiting to do an anti-Klan march. Right? So I was really encouraged to find that the whole feeling was, was anti-Klan. The, the anti-Klan group was just diminished by, by all of the sentiments of people just coming from the streets and everywhere, showing that they didn't want them on the streets of Dallas. And the only reason that they could possibly continue that march was that there was a line of blue policemen that was between the people who were in white and the people who were in green military uniforms and the crowd. So you could tell the police from the Klan then? Well, they went from <laughs> white uniforms to green uniforms to blue uniforms to the people. Mm -hmm. Velma, it's a, isn't it a rather startling thing that's happening recently and that the, the Klan is being fought overtly every step of the way all around the country? Because the Klan is, seem to be popping up in all parts of the country, but it seems like every time they do, somebody is, uh, mainly the blacks, it seems, are putting the finger on them. And right. 
Right, and, and I think that, uh, that that should happen. That's one of the reasons why um, I went up to Dallas, because, you know, historically the, uh, the Klan have always targeted the blacks and the Jews to uh, take out whatever revenge, I, I don't know why it would be revenge, but whatever, the hatred, hatred against blacks. And so I think that, uh, that blacks should uh, fight back. I know I personally am not going to go back uh, where the people were in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s having to, uh, having to deal with the Klan or be afraid uh, of the Klan and not fight back. Adelia, does the Klan have, have a historic uh, antipathy or have operations against uh, Chicanos and Mexicans in the past? Yeah, because I think the, the Klan mentality is, is a sort of mentality that's against anything that isn't, you know, the white supremacist type of person. And that, of course, does not include, you know, Chicanos or Mexican Americans, you know. Um, and, and so, you know, they're against us, is there against the blacks, is there against the Jews, is there against anybody that isn't, you know, that doesn't fit their, their own category. You know, you know. Historically, uh, you normally hear about the Klan in relationship to the blacks, but historically, uh, down in this part of the country, has the Klan been active against the Mexican Americans? Do you know? Uh, no, not that I know. But the, the time that I know for sure that they were actively against Mexican Americans about three years ago, when they were uh, patrolling the border, uh, trying to keep uh, yeah. more uh, immigrants from coming in, more you know, Mexicans from coming into the United States, and they were patrolling the border. At that time, uh, some groups from Austin went and again did an anti-patrol type thing, and uh, you know, no incidents occurred. Mm -hmm. But they were out there, so you know, they're they're doing the same thing. Casey, what is the Klan attitude toward women? I think that they use women as uh, puppets, like in, in this Dallas demonstration, it was supposedly called by a grandmotherly type woman. Um, and there was a lot of... Um, you mean a woman is head of the KKK in Dallas? Well, she, they, they were calling, in the press, they were calling her the uh, Grand Klegel, I think, or, the, or just Klegel, <laughs> perhaps. Klegel. Klegel of the realm mm -hmm. for, oh. for her particular <laughs> clan. And there are a, a, a number of different clans. It's not just one clan. It's, it's a number of um, smaller groups, sometimes just maybe 30 or 40, and sometimes big ones that have consolidated. But she's, um, supposedly, she called the march. And when she was quoted in the paper, it just seemed like she wouldn't. She didn't, she didn't have a real grasp on reality too much. It was more, um, I, I just really felt that she was being used. She didn't that, understand what No, was that she happened. really didn't. She had a lot of hatred, a lot of racial hatred. Um, but it wasn't, it seemed like it had been directed from elsewhere and that she was a convenient person to be um, yeah. the media figure for it all because it, it fits into the whole um, mom and um, American pie, American yeah. dream pie, yeah. Well, well Deborah, you've done work in England with uh, KKK type of situation and the women in the, what, you, not United Front, what do you call it? No, it's called the National, National Front, Front, right. Front. And you actually did some uh, uh, work um, and extensive experience with women actually in that organization, didn't you? Right. First, I want to say that the National Front is a fascist organization, as is the Ku Klux Klan fascist organization. And uh, the similarities are striking, that they uh, both use minority groups to scapegoat ills that they, uh, that, that they feel have been addressed uh, particularly towards them and they feel that uh, they have a call for uh, nationalism with no analysis of uh, the economic situation with, within that nation. And um, the, the National Front organizes much the same way the KK does. They, they, they have costumes on. They usually are, are dressed in black. They're called 
when, when they go out, and uh, much of their strategy is the same. Their use of uh, women, again, like Casey was saying, they use uh, women, and uh, they don't have any real interest in women's issues. But, for example, women are always put at the front of national front marches. No, they don't really have any power. They have no power, but they're just used so that the uh, anti-national front group wouldn't throw rocks hopefully, you know. So in any consideration, you put them right at the front of the march. Well, what about the way they felt about, and what was their experience that led them to be uh, yes, pro-National Front? Well, well, the women that I worked with were in another situation. They were very insular anyway. I mean, they were kept at home pretty much, and their duty was to stay in the house and take care of the children and, of course, have the meal read, ready when the bloke came home from work. Uh, and uh, uh, their, um, uh, the, when they got active in the Klan was that either they are more than likely, in most cases their daughter, had been beaten up and raped. Now it just happened to be that the men who beat and raped them were black men. Um, so they were really angry about that. They were really angry about their declining uh, standard of living. And the only analysis of the situation they got was this pamphlet that came through their letterbox from the National Front. So what we tried to do with the women anyway is when the, when the blokes went off to the pub was to ask if we could come in and interview them. So we brought in small portable camera equipment. And we interviewed them just about their lives, you know. And they talked about their children getting beaten up, and they talked about their husbands losing their jobs, and they talked about these sort of issues. So then we took the cameras then to other areas of town, again, only to women, where there, there had been similar social problems, but a different analysis. So that when we came back in, uh, we'd uh, ask them if they wanted to see their tape, and of course they did, and we'd say, oh, and by the way, we ask another group of women questions similar to this, would you, would you like to see how they did? And the hope about it was is that, that actually we felt that, 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 that their problems were real. I mean, we really don't feel that these people started out as a group of maniacs, which often the press builds them up to be. But often it started out with people with real concerns, you know, but who had been uh, uh, fed uh, a really dangerous analysis of this and who had not had access to uh, the kind of analysis that you might have if you'd been privileged enough to go to a university or, or, or engage in a dialogue such as this. One of the things that really excited me a lot about watching the video footage you took up in Dallas, Deborah, was that the anti-Klan demonstration was composed of a lot of people, all kinds of colors. Mm -hmm. Do you think that perhaps the uh, KKK challenge will bring about a coalition of of people who are of various of various colors? It's who not will only finally colors, unite? It's you think? Minorities, not all minorities, right? Because it's also lesbians and homosexuals, mm -hmm. as well They're as blacks, uh, Chicanos, and women. Jews. Anyone yeah. who is not of a white male supremacist caste is their enemy. And Protestant, they're against Catholics, yeah. historically also. Mm -hmm. Yes, and there was a big Catholic contingent marching mm -hmm. on yeah. that. Yeah. Well, do you see this nationwide uh, uh, from the reports of the press or from the word you've been getting that a, a coalition of yes. various people are yes. gathering on this? Yes, I, I think that that whole issue is going to cause, or is causing, a, a coalition to form around the country. And almost every anti-demonstration, uh, there is a, group, a mixed group of people. Mm -hmm. It's a coalition of people that are fighting against the client. Well, it seems like uh, looking at the two demonstrations that were uh, happening at the same time, that same weekend, the one in Greensboro, yeah, South Carolina, mm -hmm. and the one in Dallas, the one in Dallas was was popularly organized. There were neighborhood groups and uh, just just all different kinds of people, um, all mixed in and all. It was huge. Twenty-five hundred people, maybe more. 
that in Greensboro it was organized by one group that came from outside of the community and violence occurred because it was it well it wasn't indigenous to the community no it wasn't indigenous in uh, there were not well, there were not the varieties of people in the broad-based support. And to really make a strong stand against the Klan, it's, it, it seems like it's going to have to be coalitions. Why is it, there's a resurrection of the Klan now? Is it economic? That may be valid. Uh, coupled with the, the Civil Rights Act, uh, mm -hmm. some of the, some of the uh, statements that I've heard uh, Klansmen make or people with, with Klan mentality is that each time you give a black or a minority another right, then you take away a white right, okay? So that has a lot to do with it too. Uh, the jobs, of course, are tight in the economy. Um, and then this country's ideas have shifted more to the right now ever since the, the Nixon administration has been uh, very instrumental in uh, manipulating the citizens of this country into thinking more conservatively. And uh, that has a, a lot to do with it. Yeah, uh, and that's reflected also in minorities. You know, a lot of minorities, and uh, when I say minorities, I want to include everybody, you know, uh, blacks, browns, uh, women, you know, also have shifted to the right, and they're more comfortable, more settled in, you know, in the, in the positions that they're in, and they're not going to make as many ways as they used to, or at least this is the way it's being perceived. And, uh, you know, it's taking this to get people to, to get up and to form coalitions and to come out and protest and march. And, uh, you know, see that, I don't think that was anticipated by, by uh, the Klan's people. I'm, I'm sure that the anti-Klan march in Dallas was not anticipated by the Klan's people. And I think that's another reason why, you know, it's, it's starting to sort of take a strong foothold. It's because, you know, the, the whole, um, you know, just mood seem to be seem to be where, where they wouldn't get any mm -hmm. any uh, friction that that that's part of w when people say well if you just ignore the clan it's better cuz they'll just go away that's part of the the complacency that people feel that well especially white people i think maybe they feel like they can ignore it whereas uh black and brown people are confronted with it more directly and so can't, cannot, haven't been able to. And white people are just now perhaps um, being affected by economic conditions that could make people swing either way. And swing towards the, swinging towards the Klan um, is a matter of misinformation, mm -hmm. it seems like not enough resources. But still, I mean, uh, there's a, a white, a privileged class, certainly it has a lot of benefits from the Klan itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Klan acts as a sort of a, a mafia mm -hmm. for them to threaten minority groups and hopefully keep them in their place by terrorist activities so that they continue uh, uh, in enjoying certain privileges which they may not have earned by the sweat of their own brow. Was there another aspect of it too, that the Klan acts as kind of a lightning rod too, a deflector in, in, a, in a sense. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the chants up in Dallas said the, uh, um, the Klan is our enemy. Well, if the Klan can be focused on, everybody say, okay, we hate the Klan, people are forgetting about the whole system within which the Klan and everybody else operates, the, the racist uh, system and the economic benefits that uh, will go to the, to the ruling class and the economic system so that it stays the way it is. Keep the people the down under, keep the underlings mm -hmm. fighting among each other and they won't uh, stop and take a look at the system as a whole and how it fits into them, mm -hmm. it seems to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people, people look, uh, the media treats the Klan often as clowns, kind of, they're kind of foolish or they're kind of silly in their costumes and um, sort of making them uh, harmless in a way, like, well, this, these are people who are just crazy fringe elements. 
How was the how was the situation in Dallas treated on the mass media? Did any of you watch TV up there? And I watched the television program, and more coverage was given to the Klan march than to the anti-Klan march, which was much much larger, and um, very little was said about the anti-Klan march. You know, and all the emphasis went to the to the Klan. You know, and, and very little to what was going. You know, to oppose it. I saw the um, newspaper coverage here in Austin the next day. I didn't stay in Dallas very long after the rally. As a matter of fact, I stayed there about 30 minutes after the rally. I didn't want to be caught on the highway after dark with a group of clans standing waiting on us, you know. Uh, so I was back in Austin <laughs> by the time we started. But I read the paper the next day, and very little coverage was given to the uh, counter march. A lot of coverage, front page picture on the front page, pictures of uh, what's the woman's name, the grand 73-year-old woman that's supposed to have organized that demonstration. They had pictures in color on it, ab about that and very little coverage on the, um, on the counter march. And for some reason, our numbers had shrunk by the time it reached <laughs> the paper. <laughs> you know? Yeah, the Dallas radio uh, reported 50 Klan's people marching and nothing whatsoever about a counter demonstration. And the student newspaper, The Texan, here, uh, gave more coverage to uh, um, 2,500 people running in a foot race here in Austin than they did to the people who were marching against the Klan in Dallas. Did anybody watch the local coverage of the Austin TV stations of the what happened up in Dallas? No, no, I was no but they had an aerial traveling. photograph, wasn't that? They right? had an aerial photograph. Mm -hmm. uh, from looking at various sources, it seems, it, it looks to me like in situations like this, they frequently will say, okay, here are the clans, they're a crazy bunch of, you know, idiots. And then the people they're against, or, pe or the people who are demonstrating against the clans, they're also a violent bunch of people too. So we got crazies on one side and crazies on the other side. And in between, protecting us all is the law, <laughs> are the police, and the judges. Isn't that nice? You know. So they have this binary system where each is one, each is equally bad, right? They never go into an analysis of what the situation really is, or what the people. I think you mentioned Deborah about getting inside mm -hmm. the the groups and what the people are really like and what the, the how they really feel about the situation and what their concerns really are. Because I think that the people, that there are concerns there. On both, both sides. sides. Yeah. And that they need and those to concerns aren't addressed. Do. It's just the effective part that you see, uh -huh. and not the concerns that led people there, or the thinking that led people there, too. You were talking about where, uh, how the police sort of, uh, the police and the judges stand in the middle, protecting all the silent uh, masses who are basically good. Um, the police, in, in the case of the Dallas March, were, uh, they, they had nothing to do with the counter demonstration except you'd see isolated ones sort of standing around watching. Are they taking pictures of DPS, taking mm -hmm. pictures for their well, files? Well, not, not in uniform. <coughs> not in uniform. No. But the Klan March, on the other hand, had to be completely flanked by police. Mm. They, they couldn't have had it without police there. And the the Klan's people were protected by the police and when they were threatened too much, they were led into a city building mm -hmm. and then bussed out by a city bus. Mm -hmm. So they were being protected by the state, by the, the local government. And the feeling I got uh, when we would pass the police during the, the um, march was that they were ready. They were all in their riot gear and their rod sticks, night sticks already, to me it looked like they were ready to attack us and we were just, you know, doing a peaceful march. And uh, they weren't there to protect us. I didn't feel protected by them. As a matter of fact, I felt threatened by their presence. We always do. Nope. In Go ahead. Incidentally, there were a lot of, uh, you know, picture, there was a lot of picture taking by policemen because we recognized some of the same faces at other marches in other cities. So, you know, they were definitely there, you know, we, we already know them. 
and you know we saw them doing the same thing they do at every market, and that's take pictures. What about here in Austin now? Is there a clan here in Austin? Is there a chapter? Has anybody seen any? Yeah. Ever heard anything? Yeah, I think it's a chapter here. Who's that? I think that it's it's members of some members of the police association. I think that may be a chapter. Um, well, it, it, that's not unusual, though, is it? From what what, what I've read, that the uh, police in much of the country sympathize with the KKK and are actually uh, many of them are uh, sure, members uh, of I the mean, organization. In, in Houston, uh, there were there were some policemen. I guess some of them still are on the force that were members of the Klan. I don't know that these guys are really members of the Klan. They don't wear white sheets. They wear blue uniforms, uh, but they have the same Klan mentality. And it wouldn't surprise me if they, if they are John Birch's, you know, opposed to being calling themselves clans, but the mentality is that. So I'd have to say yes, the clan is here in Austin. I must say, in all fairness to the John Birch Society, that the clan newspaper, the Thunderbolt, thinks that the Birchers are horrible leftists. The John Birch Society is way to the left of the clan. <laughs> but it's still way to the right of. <laughs> right. So, uh, we're still right. being a little threatened by any by any group uh, like that. We, um, I personally do. Well, do you think, in the final analysis, that it's actually a, a hopeful thing that uh, maybe the the clan carrying out these activities can cause a po such a positive and strong reaction that it will unite minorities? and perhaps bring the majority along with it? I don't know about the majority. <laughs> I think that the, you know, it's good, it's good to have a coalition of all people, uh, all kinds of people, all races of people uh, involved. It's just real sad that that's why we had to get a coalition, is because, you know, the racism in this country are really crazy, you know, the Klan. I think that's really sad. Uh, in many instances, people are going to die. People have died. People are going to die at the hands of the Klan to get people, you know, together. Well, let's hope that this is just the start of a coalition that will show the Klan for what it is. And hopefully, if there's any way of getting the mass media, at least maybe we've done our little bit, to show that it's not just some isolated small aspect of American society, but an integrated part of the overall system, racism, and the economic system, and the political system. Maybe we've made one little bit of progress tonight for the few people who do watch Alternative Views News Magazine. Thank you for being with us. It was great. Good night. Yeah!